clean a recession. We are very fortunate to have Archimandrite Robert Taft, the Vice Rector of the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome, professor there of liturgy, and we could not ask for a more eminent exponent of liturgical theology than he. When I think of Father Robert, I think of his great work from which I've learned so much on the great entrance. But that, of course, is only one in a series of volumes that he is writing on the history of the liturgy. And those volumes are only the tip of the iceberg, as it says in this conference program, he's published over 400 essays, articles, booklets, and books on the topic of the liturgy. So he equals perhaps St. Augustine or Origen in his output. <laughs> I don't know which of those he would prefer to be compared with. <laughs> I recommend to my students the small booklet that he's written on the Byzantine liturgy, only about 70 pages, but so much knowledge and insight concentrated there. And it is, in fact, for sale on the bookstore. You cannot do better than start with that. So, Father Robert, we are glad you are with us. We know you have to go later today to Lviv in the Ukraine. But fortunately, you have been able to stay this morning. And Father Robert's theme will be communion in the Holy Spirit in the Byzantine liturgy, a very appropriate theme as we are meeting under the sign of Pentecost. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, Bishop Kalistos. Your Beatitude, Metropolitan Theodosius, who honors us by his presence here. We saw Kapresa Shenishi Vladik of Sevalod. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, that count is now up over 500, by the way, so. <laughs> <laughs> In this lecture, I shall give what theologians call a close reading to the theme, Communion in the Holy Spirit, a central communion motif in the Eucharistic half of the Byzantine Divine Liturgy. The importance of such an exercise for our conference theme should be obvious. Liturgy has always been considered the very heart of the Church's life. It is the Church's chief way of saying what it is. First, a word on nomenclature. Byzantine liturgical Greek commonly uses two words for communion. The older Pauline term kinonia, which means communion in a variety of senses, from Eucharistic communion with God, ecclesial communion, or our communion with one another, and with the Holy Trinity in the body of Christ that is the Church, Holy Communion in the Eucharist, and so forth. This Greek term, kinonia, usually rendered prichasti in Slavonic, or more rarely, preobschenia, but the more recent current term for communion in Byzantine liturgical Greek is metalipsis, in Slavonic, prichaschenia. Here I will be dealing principally with the concept of communion in the richer and more inclusive sense of the older Greek term, kinonia. So first, the texts of the liturgy. The first text of the divine liturgy I wish to consider comes at the very beginning of the anaphora when the presiding celebrant greets the assembled congregation with a slightly expanded redaction of the Pauline greeting in 2 Corinthians 3.13. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit, kinonian tu agio nevmatos, be with you all. File that text away for future reverence because we'll see as we go along just what that 
kinonia to agionevmatos means, and some of the problems from a theological point of view in explaining it. Our problems, not the problem of the text, of course, which is in Scripture and in the liturgy. The same theme of communion in the Holy Spirit is resumed in the epiclesis, or an Afril invocation of the Holy Spirit on the gifts and on the communicants, the prayer par excellence, in which the Eastern Eucharistic prayers express their theology of Holy Communion. The text of the Chrysostom epiclesis reads as follows, Send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these offered gifts, and make this bread the precious body of your Christ, and that which is in this chalice the precious blood of your Christ, changing them by your Holy Spirit, so that for those who receive them, they might be for the sobriety of soul, for forgiveness of sins, for communion in your Holy Spirit, for fullness of the kingdom, for filial confidence before you, and not unto judgment or damnation. The epiclesis of the Anaphora of St. Basil reads, We pray you and beseech you, O Holy of Holies, that by the favor of your goodness, your Holy Spirit may come upon us and upon these offered gifts, and bless and hallow and show them, anadikse, show this bread to be indeed the precious body of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, and this cup to be indeed the precious blood of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ shed for the life of the world, again, so that all who partake of them, metechontas, of this bread and chalice may be united to one another in the communion of the one Holy Spirit, and that the partaking of the holy body and blood of your Christ may be for none of us under judgment or condemnation, but that we might find mercy and grace together with all the saints. And then there follows the commemoration of the saints and of the departed. Our next text is in the pre-communion litany following the anaphora. From my textual analysis of the manuscript tradition and using the, the methods of comparative liturgy, I have shown that the original nucleus of this litany comprised the following three members. First, having commemorated all the saints again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Secondly, for the precious gifts offered and consecrated, let us pray to the Lord that our God, the lover of humankind, having received them on his holy and heavenly and spiritual altar as a pleasing spiritual fragrance, may send down upon us in return the divine grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. And then having asked, thirdly, having asked for the unity of faith and the communion of the Holy Spirit once more, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. Although the earliest witness to the primitive central petition of this triad, the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 8, Number 13, a Greek text from the environs of Antioch around the year A.D. 380, does not mention the Holy Spirit, it is clear that this theme was there almost from the start. For well, we find it around 388, 392 in Theodore of Mopsuestia's Catechetical Homily Number 16, as well as in the parallel litanies of the Liturgy of St. James, the Armenian Sur Patarag, a holy sacrifice, and so forth. So the primitive nucleus of this litany was a petition that God received the oblation on the heavenly altar and send down upon us in return his divine grace and the gifts of the Holy Spirit presumably doing so by means of our reception of Holy Communion, which is described elsewhere in the pre-communion precisely as a kinonia, a communion, in or of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to insist the way some people like to about the preposition, it means the same thing. The concluding commendation of the same litany resumes the same thematic, having asked for the unity of faith and the communion of the Holy Spirit, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. In this petition for unity of faith and communion in the Holy Spirit, we see a reflection of the epiclesis of both the Chrysostom and Basil anaphoras. The Chrysostom epiclesis prays for the communion of the Holy Spirit, whereas the Basil text includes the unity of theme, the unity of Christ's body, not a faith is specified, though of course theologically there's no difference whatsoever between unity in the faith and unity in the church. <clears throat> the text reads, so that all of us who partake of the one bread and chalice may be united with one another in the communion of the one Holy Spirit. 
Then we come to the prayer before communion. The petition for communion in the Holy Spirit is resumed once again in the pre-communion prayer accompanying the litany before communion in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. To you, O Master and lover of humankind, we entrust our whole life and hope. We implore you, we pray you, we, we entreat you. Make us worthy to receive your heavenly and awesome mysteries from this holy and spiritual table with a pure conscience for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of offenses, the communion of the Holy Spirit, is nevmatos segiu kinonion, the inheritance of the heavenly kingdom, and not uh, for filial confidence before you, that phrase is not in the original text, that comes from the epiclesis, and not for judgment or condemnation. Now how is one to understand this incessantly repeated insistence that in Holy Communion we receive the Holy Spirit? What is this divine gift, this Pauline communion of the Holy Spirit, which our liturgies invoke time and time again? Do we not receive, rather, communion in the one body of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 10? This is a pseudo-problem. In classic Trinitarian theology, the one God and the divine nature is the cause of the whole economy of salvation, and this divine nature is the nature of each and all three of the persons of the Holy Trinity. The only distinctions in God are those interior to the Trinity itself. The Father is neither Son nor Holy Spirit. The Son is neither Father nor Spirit. The Spirit is neither Father nor Son. But whatever one of the persons does, whatever one of them is, there too the entire divine nature is and acts with the other two persons according to the order of the economy of salvation. This classic teaching is expounded relentlessly by St. John Chrysostom. With the Spirit present, he says, it cannot be that Christ not be present. For where one hypostasis of the Trinity is present, the whole Trinity is present, for they are inseparable. Chrysostom insists on this in his sermon on the letter to the Romans, homily 13. Again, for, for of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the gift and the power is one. From our perspective, the Holy Spirit is the symbol of this unity, and all God's saving activity comes to us from the Father, through the Son, but is accomplished in the Holy Spirit. Again, Chrysostom, see how great is the power of the Spirit. What God does, the Spirit is said to do. So too with the sacraments, again, Chrysostom. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dispenses everything, panta economi. The priest lends his tongue and offers his hand. Homily 86 on the Gospel of John. For Chrysostom, what we participate in through Holy Communion, therefore, is the divine nature of the Word incarnate. And it is this divine nature which nourishes us spiritually under the material signs of the Eucharist, just as it is the incarnate Word who in his Paschal mystery saves us through his humanity in a parallelism that is constant in the Father's since Justin and Irenaeus. To put it another way, as Chrysostom does in his homily on 1 Corinthians 24, our Eucharistic communion in the one body of Christ is a communion with Christ himself. And I quote, it is the only begotten Son of God himself whom you receive in a communion whereby we become one body in him. But what we receive in communion can also be named the grace of the Spirit, Chrysostom insists in several passages. Let us approach this table and the nipple of the spiritual cup like nursing children. Let us eagerly draw out the grace of the Spirit, for to share in the divinity of Christ is to be in communion also with the Father and the Holy Spirit. To share the same divine nature, so to receive the Eucharist is to receive the Holy Spirit, end of quotation. Again, in the homily on Matthew, 40, uh, 45th homily on Matthew, he gave, he first gave you to drink from his own cup. He gave you the Spirit to drink. Homily on 1 Corinthians 27. Have you enjoyed a royal table? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? On the Gospel of John, homily 46, from this table springs up a fountain that sends forth spiritual rivers. 
many are the streams of that fountain which the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, sends forth, and the Son is the mediator. Similar roles of Son and Spirit in Eucharist and baptism are outlined by St. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians. After explaining in chapter 10 that we are one body through participation in the one Eucharist, Paul con con continues in 1 Corinthians 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. Chrysostom's teaching reflects the developed Trinitarian theology, uh, theology of Nicaea I and Constantinople I, and a, 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 a theology that is so marked in his writings. He sums it up in his homily on 2 Corinthians 30, his final homily on the Pauline letter, commenting on the famous closing salutation with which the epistle ends and our anaphora begins. Since I'm trying to cut down a bit, since we're a little bit late, that passage is much too long to cite, but those who are interested can cite it in the printed text. I have it here in English translation, but it's over two pages long, and so I'm going to skip it. So we can say that for Chrysostom, in the Eucharist we receive, through the Son, communion with the Father in the Holy Spirit. For, as he tells us, in his homily 86 on the Gospel of John, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 